My name's Debbie Frearson and I'm the Festival Coordinator for the Council for British Archaeology. Um, as part of the launch of the series of interviews, um, we are talking to John Henry Phillips in, our, in conversation with. So John's an award-winning archaeologist, author and filmmaker of Romany descent, who founded and led an ex expedition to locate the wreck of LCH-185 and also produced uh, the accompanying documentary, No Roses on a Sailor's Grave. Um, and he's written a more in-depth book about it, which is due to be published next year. He's founder of a Romany Community Archaeology, which is a non-profit um, uncovering the archaeology of Romany communities alongside present day Romany people. So you can ask questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and my colleague um, Claire Corker will moderate. Um, it would be great if you could put in the chat um, where you're from and who you are so we know who's with us please. Um, there are a set of questions that are asking all interviewees as part of this in conversation series, um, but this is interspersed with proper chat as well. Um, at the end of this um, webinar, we're just going to put a poll up if you could answer just those three questions that will appear on your screen and that helps us with funding as well. So um, welcome, John. <laughs> we're really pleased to have you here. Um, what we would like to know is where did you grow up? Where did you whereabouts in the country did you um, grow up? Um, I grew up just outside of a town called Bury St Edmunds in a village called Thurston, which is in Suffolk. And uh, no one has ever normally heard of it. So I'll be surprised if anyone has today. But yeah, in the Suffolk countryside. That's interesting. Did you embrace your Romany roots from the beginning or was this kind of a later self-discovery? Was it always in the background and you wanted to explore the heritage more? Or is it more of a recent? Um, no, no, it's, uh, it's, it's no, it's no recent discovery or anything like that. That's just, that's just what our family is. That's, that's yeah, obviously known it the whole time and, and all that. Uh, started speaking about it more in line with my career and my work uh, last year. I suppose, but but I mean, it wasn't like it was any sort of um, big moment. It's just that it never really came up in my career because it, it's not that relevant to to what I do. You know. Okay. And what was your first archaeological memory? Um, well, I think it was um, there was a, a, an excavation in my village when they were building a, a new housing estate, and uh, my dad and I used to walk around and, and look at the holes after they'd all gone home and uh, I actually ended up working for that company years later and my dad found the newspaper article that we cut out because we were so excited about it but just that and oh and also um one of my relatives uh years before I was born but found the uh, the Milton Hall treasure oh wow um, so that was always a thing in the family that that story and I remember my dad buying me uh well, my mum and dad buying me a a book by Roe Dahl uh called the Milton Hall treasure and reading that and and then going to visit the the field where it was because it's not too far away from me in Barry Seven. so yeah those two that's quite a tangible and did you take an academic route into archaeology or volunteer hands-on experience or both how did you get involved yourself um yeah I I joined the the young archaeologist club as I'm sure many people did when I was younger yeah. I've, I've still got the badge somewhere um that's quite old now and then years later, when I was about 21, I suppose, I did my first excavation in Norfolk at a place called Sedgeford. Um, and I met a lot of people there that I, I still in, I'm still in touch with now. But after that, I went to university and did an archaeology degree at University of Leicester. And yeah, after that, I was an archaeologist. Well done. And um, some, some of the questions that we're asking are, have come in from the public and everything. So I'm kind of interspersing them um, with learning about you as well. So awesome. I know I know you're relatively young, um, but what piece of advice would you give for your younger self, do you think, at the start of your archaeological career? Um, God, I don't know. That's a that's an interesting one. Probably I, I don't know, dig a bit more carefully. I, I, used to, I used to put my back out quite a lot in the early days. But I don't do that so much these days, but um, yeah, take it a bit more easy. Don't try and impress people as much. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Don't kill yourself digging that hole. That's yeah, absolutely. Advice. Yeah. 
Is there any advice that you would give parents or carers of someone who wanted to do a degree in archaeology or go into archaeology as a trainee at all? Um, other than just kind of give it a go. Yeah. I think that's probably the only advice I'd have on, on that. Um, uh, one of the archaeology is interesting because it's one of those things where if you go to like a family wedding or a night out or something there's always someone who's like oh I always want to be an archaeologist and I don't think people realize that there's actually so many opportunities to take part yeah it's not uh, as I'm always, exclusive exactly I'm always saying to people well you can always volunteer on a, on a dig or you know go to talks that people put on and stuff like that and there's so many opportunities so I suppose I'd say just just get involved, give it a go. And if you don't like it, that's Yeah, fine. excellent. I want to move on to your film. Um, I've got um, a clip here that will, it's about a three minute clip. So we'll play that. Might be a little bit crazy, but I want to find my friend's uh, sunken landing craft off the coast of Normandy. What kind of challenges do you think I'm going to face? Have you done it? No. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> My name is John Henry Phillips and I'm a 25 year old archaeologist. I love 20th century conflict history, Second World War, First World War. In 2016 I was in Normandy and I met a really gentle and sweet man called Patrick Thomas. Patrick! Yeah John? How are you? All right, in the morning, mate. I was just going to say, that is when we heard uh, Neville Chamberlain say, we are now at war. Yeah. And he told me the story of how he'd been on a landing craft that landed at Salt Beach. The next thing I knew, we were underwater. And then it sadly did some, most of the crew going to the bottom of the sea. I'm probably the only survivor. I should have mentioned that I'm the only one that's And I made this promise to find the wreck. No one knows where it is. No one knows where it went down. Where do you think it might be, Patrick? About there, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the bow. There are these clear moments and images in his story that, that stick with him. And which way is Normandy? I've lost my Boy Scout thing on that one. <laughs> and I think it's about pasting those together. The way I view it, it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. Has John told you what he's going to do? Well, not precisely. Every time something new comes up, there's another question that he's answered. It is the landing craft, but it also had another identity on it. So on D Day, we remember seeing these really beautiful houses. Yes. We're in Normandy, um, and I've just tracked down these houses, and they're not in Leon's Mare at all. <laughs> so I wonder if it could actually be a little bit further down the beach. So it does seem to be quite confusing. You know, when I said to Patrick, I'll find your ship, it seemed like a pretty simple task. Go to France, find where the ship went down, put a plaque up. You've got your work cut out. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is the grave of Jack Barringer, Patrick's friend. Yeah, poor Jack has disappeared beneath the waves. Of all the crew that went down, there's only four graves. As far as I can tell, I've been the only one visiting Jack Barringer's grave. This morning, I'm off to meet the mayor of Leon St. Mayor. Bonjour. Bonjour. What do you think about putting a memorial in this town? I'm an archaeologist, I'm not a diver, I'm not a maritime explorer. Worryingly, it has become a bit of an obsession now. And hoping to find it whilst he's still with us. It's like we're on a road trip together. Yeah. <laughs> it's very soon this history will be beyond living memory and veterans will no longer be around. We do for you to dive. Everywhere we go, the women flirt with you, don't they? It's always this like, horrible moment where you say bye and you don't know, like, is that? Gotta be the last time you ever see this person. You don't get that many chances to change someone's life and to make sure that someone will never be forgotten. I think I know where it is. You might about to be showing me what could be Patrick's ship. <laughs> if I can find the ship, I can change history and I can change Patrick's life. And Patrick's story will be there forever. It's just so nice that I've managed to do that for him. <laughs> So during the festival, there's been a few emotional things for me. And I, that's the third time I've watched that. And I can't, I still end up um, feeling quite emotional about it. Um, how did you get interested in conflict archaeology of the 21st century in the first place? Um, that was kind of what I wanted to do from the, the get go, really. I was really into just archaeology in general when I was younger. And then I took so long 
away from it. And then, yeah, I went to um, the First World War battlefields when I was about 20, 19, 20, something like that. And um, just all the stuff that was churned up by the plow and on the side of the, the, the fields, that kind of um, kind of reawakened that passion for archaeology that I'd had as a kid. And that kind of um, came at the same time that my, my granddad, uh, who was a, an RAF commando, during the Second World War, it was about the time that he was um, getting just just a little bit too old to really get the full truth out, out of what he did. Um, so that all kind of culminated in this this one um, to kind of preserve those stories, and uh, yeah, that that came out as conflict archaeology at the time, and that's how No Roses came about. Wow! So is this the best thing that you've ever found? <laughs> Well, I mean, you have, you have to watch the film to find out if we find it. Yeah, <laughs> would you? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that's the best thing I've ever done archaeologically, archaeologically uh, without a doubt. Um, I, I think, think it's it going to be hard to top. Actually. Yeah, it's going to be hard to top that in terms of, you know, everything. I think books, films, yeah. archaeology, it was, a, it was a big one. Um, it just it just got bigger and bigger this this was actually the trailer we did um based on the kind of one one week's worth of filming at the very oh, start wow. this was before we had kind of the funding or any plan whatsoever uh so this represents about a tenth of what actually happened and then everything just got bigger and bigger and bigger so it's that it is definitely going to be harder to to top that with the um logistics in the movie how do you go about getting funding for it how did it how did it just expand like that so um, I was working with a production company called Go Button Media in Canada. Uh, I was working with them before we did No Roses on some other projects. And then when I met Pat, um, I mean, it's important to like to note that th it was a genuine project that then oh, yeah, we, yeah. We made a documentary of. So I, I met Pat and it all spiraled from there. And because I was already working with this production company, then it became a, a documentary. Um, so they they stumped up a, an, an awful lot of the funding for it. And then we crowdfunded um, a percentage of it as well. Right. And, that, and that's how uh, that's how it came about. That's how we funded the whole thing. So does that media company enter the films into or to the U European film festivals, or does it get chosen to be entered into those? Um, I think they I think they uh, submit it to to the film festivals. Yeah. Okay. Um, just wondered if your tux was tax deductible as well. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. When I my tax. Only if you attend the event as well. Yeah. So, well, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> I get to at some point. I've missed quite a few of them. You could go virtually and then say it was workwear, probably. Well, don't, I have don't, gone don't to quote me on that. Don't quote me on yeah, that. Yeah, I've gone to a few online, but I didn't bother to dress up for them. <laughs> so, um, the book that goes with the series is out next year. How, how does that differ from the film or is it just a narrative of the film? No, no, it's um, it's kind of its own standalone thing, really. Okay. Um, it, it tells the full story of the history of, of the, the the ship, the, the landing craft. In the film, that kind of picks up at D-Day. Right, um, okay. And ends with D-Day. Uh, sorry, ends two weeks later when it sinks, but it, it fought in two other campaigns before... Normandy um, had a whole other life um, and then that is intertwined with my telling of the story of searching for uh, the wreck from kind of beginning to to end and it, it's a lot it's a lot more personal uh, than the film the film's great don't get me wrong I love it but but the book uh, it's kind of my telling of the story I suppose uh, yeah rather than somebody directing you yeah it's kind of my, my my take on it my experience what it's I mean essentially you come along for the for the whole ride with me I suppose is what yeah the book. it seems quite a, an emotional investment as well as a physical one yeah absolutely there's a lot of crying in the film I mean there's some crying in the trailer actually yeah <laughs> it was the well, first time I saw it it was a lump in the throat I thought I've got to pull it together for tonight yeah well <laughs> so um I'm going to move on now it sounds a bit harsh but I'm going to move on now to your Romany project yep. um the Romany community project um where's it taking place is it your first project this one yeah so the, the, we're doing kind of a pilot project of it which is uh down in the new forest okay uh, is there much support locally yeah yeah we have got a lot of support we've been working with um 
the New Forest Heritage Centre, um, they're really on board with it. We've got support from local politicians and the local uh, traveller community. Um, we've got all the right permissions as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people are really, really uh, excited about it, which is nice because, you know, I think it's got potential to be something really, really special. So who else is involved in that project? Is it just you running it on your own or are there other professional archaeologists? Yeah, I work with a guy called Dr. Stuart Eve. Um, and we met both working on the uh, Waterloo Uncovered project with veterans out in Belgium. And uh, we, yeah, we've known each other since then. And we've partnered on this to, to work together on the project. He, he's down in the New Forest. Um, and he's an absolute wealth of knowledge and he's a great person to, to work alongside. So at the moment it's us two and then Kath Walker at the uh, New Forest Heritage Centre. Yeah. And then we've got people in the community and, and people that help out the community down there. So is that starting this year or when does it start? Yeah, we're hoping to get it, get the first uh, kind of archaeologist in by the end of the year. Um, but we're just sorting out, you know, funding and stuff like that. Yeah. But, Are you hoping with it being a pilot that it's the first of many? Yeah, I think I think it's got legs. I think we could really take it all over the country and perhaps outside of the country. Um, just we'll just see how it goes, but it's, it's yeah. going to be great. We're working with a, a, a film company to do a couple of little short, much smaller than No Roses on a Sale is great. But yeah, there is going to be a couple of mini documentaries kind of telling the story of the site and the people who can relate to it personally and that sort of thing. Um, and based on the success of that, um, I think, yeah, we'll try and take it elsewhere We've, i get all the time people telling me about potential sites that they know yeah about. i think i i even when we met um like a month or so ago i was spouting off some near where i am in the midlands yeah and um, i yeah. think there's a real appetite for it as well with this new hybrid way of working with digital um and in person as well i think these bite-sized um community pieces um there's so much um, enthusiasm for it, especially um, as being part of the festival. Um, yeah. I see so much of it. So yeah. can you talk us through these pictures? I want you to start with the Sloans at the bottom because I think that's great if you talk us through. Yes, yeah, so um, that was found just when we were just down there for the day, actually, just kind of scoping out the place. Um, and that, that, that was used to, uh, relieve pain in joints. Um, it started off in horses and then it was moved to humans used it as well. Um, so the great thing about sort of traveler based archaeological sites is um, having artifacts to do with horses is quite a good sign that you're in the right place. And, and that was a real good moment where we saw that sticking out the ground. I mean, that that photograph, that's literally how it was. <laughs> we, we hadn't touched it. It's just sticking out the ground because it's such a kind of wealth of uh, stuff down there and the um pottery on the left hand side so that is a piece of pottery um called amari ware um and that's from the early 19th uh sorry early 1900s and that was important imported from asia and what's interesting about that is that later became well it got picked up by crown derby who make their own version called old amari and that is traditionally found in modern travellers uh, places where they live, cabinets of Crown Derby, Old Amari pattern. Um, so again, that's like a perfect link between the past, this old site that we're excavating and modern day uh, travellers. So yeah, that was, again, that was, that was an amazing moment to see that sticking out of the ground because we weren't really sure. Um, we had the idea for the, for the project, but we weren't sure if it had legs in, in the fact that was there any archeology span to be found? Uh, so seeing something like that, you know, like my 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 family has Crown Derby that looks like that. Um, so it was a great moment. Yeah. What about the basket? So the basket um, came out of the New Forest Heritage Centre, uh, and Kath kindly brought it along to the picnic that we had, which is the other photograph. Um, we had a little introductory picnic with the traveller community down there, and what's amazing about the basket is. It was made at the site uh, that we're looking into. It's made out of brambles, if I remember correctly. Wow. And Kath brought it along and showed it to the people we were with. 
um and it had the label for who made it written on there from the archives of the museum and she held it up and said oh this is who made it and the lady who made the basket her granddaughter was sat at our picnic oh, wow. to us. she didn't know we were bringing this basket we didn't know that she was coming she, she knew she knew the name straight away and said oh that's my nan that made that um which again was talking about links between the past and the present at this site that, that was just mind-blowing um and it immediately kind of showed the potential of working with a community who can personally relate to the uh, site that we're looking into. And why, um, I can see um, the community, is that your colleague there who's in the blue? Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why did you choose this site? What was so special about this site as the pilot? Um, it's, we, we, look, we chose to look into this site because it's kind of a self-contained um, archaeological site really because the, the story of it is it, it was essentially um, a compound um, not a lot of people I think a, most people in the UK are kind of um, very unaware of the sort of issues that have faced the gypsy traveler community for hundreds of years and the site we have, are at in that photograph is a perfect example of that because Basically, the New Forest had gypsies in, in there for hundreds of years. And then in the 1920s, they were put into a compound. Um, and they basically had to stay there. They couldn't, they, they had to sleep on um, floors that weren't permanent. That was part of the rule. So they ended up kind of sleeping on the mud um, and they didn't have any water and they, they lost their ability to travel, which was their way of making money traveling. Um, that was their economy so they kind of overnight just ended up in a really bad situation and then later on uh they got secondhand prefab houses and then they became um council houses later on and the the interesting thing about the compound site is that the uh descendants of the compound still live around the old compound right um, so the reason we looked into that site is because you know they're literally still there and the whole point of Romani community archaeology, as it says in the name, uh, is to work with the community. Because um, if it was if it was just people that have nothing to do with with Romani or travellers or gypsies, um, it, I don't think it has anywhere near as much meaning as actually working with the people. No, who, no, who absolutely. To them, um, which is why we did it. And so it was just an amazing example of how you can get the people involved. Who, who know more than us, you know, they know the story of that site. Um, and it's a great chance for them to teach us about the site and for us to teach them about archaeology and kind of share that, uh, that conversation between us, you know. So I know in the New Forest, only from um, because of the amount of things that have happened during the festival, that they've already got quite a strong volunteering community in there. Um, how have they um, embraced your project? Have they embraced your project, or is it like ring fence for their work, or or is it working quite well? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we haven't found any problems. It's very, very, very early days for this project. I, I must stress that. Um, at the moment, it's about building those relationships with the local uh, traveller community. Um, so we've not really had too much uh, interaction with with other volunteers. Um, but at the moment, we're just kind of concentrating on, on, on making sure we have volunteers from the actual community, the traveller community, who are incredibly, from what I've found, incredibly enthusiastic and excited about the potential of the project. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. Brilliant. And on Twitter, I mean, you're very vocal about the many phrases used to describe um, the community. Um, so what terminology is correct? Is it GRT, the Gypsy Roma Traveller community? Um, is that um, how the community is described rather than the many phrases that you have to defend? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a hot topic, really, because I know some people don't uh, agree with the different um, branches being lumped together. No, as, no. Uh, GRT, but I, that's kind of how it's spoken of in policy. Uh, okay. And so that's kind of the easiest way at the moment to refer to the community. Uh, it's, 
I think it's challenging um, for some of them, particularly like me, because you don't want to make a mistake. So mm -hmm. you just want to say, you know, when you're describing a community, if we're writing things up and everything like that, what, you know, what do we use the policy? So um, you sometimes you don't even know what the policy is and what's right or wrong. But yeah, no, I um, get that. It's about, it's about intent, isn't it? Even if you make yeah. a mistake, it's about the intent if you didn't intend to. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Okay, so. Um, it's such a brilliant project. I cannot wait to see what happens um, next. Yeah. So if money was no object to you, what would you do next? What, in, in terms of this project or in, in general? In terms of, so you've got this project under the belt. Yeah. What uh, would you like to do if you're a zillionaire? Oh, I don't, I don't know, really. That's a tough one. There's so much. There's so many different projects. I'd, pro I'd probably take this to like its biggest platform to its biggest conclusion and i suppose just try and take that uh take that around the world um there's also the, the great thing about romany people are that they have traveled a very long yeah, way yeah yeah so the potential for sites right across the world is is pretty uh high um, it'd be really interesting i think if you went to a different country and there were um obviously there's going to be differences but if there's a, a core similarity in various aspects that you could yeah. identify as well absolutely yeah right now i've got the quick fire questions where well, we don't have to go that quick but these are um some of the questions that came through from staff and everyone what's the one place you would like to do an excavation that you haven't excavated already um at the moment, I'd say there's a there's a place in Scotland called uh, Vinegar Hill, um, and I recently discovered there because um, I was going through some family history, some some my own family tree, and uh, one of my relatives who ended up dying in the in the First World War, who was a traveller, he uh, he lived at Vinegar Hill, and it was basically a, a big permanent um, showground with kind of like circus acts, horse trading. Uh, wow. it, looked like, it looked like this amazing sort of uh, Victorian era show that was on permanently. Uh, and I think that would be amazing. I'd like, I'd love to do something with Whereabouts that. in Scotland is it? I think off the top of my head, I think it's in Glasgow. All right, but, okay. Sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to I'm, put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm fairly sure it's been uh, built over now, but that's, you know, if I, if I was a zillionaire, like you say, I'd just smash through it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, right, digging conditions, hot and dry or cold and wet, urban or rural? Um, I don't know. I, I always say there's kind of no perfect weather. for. No, like, there isn't. Uh, I've dug in the snow uh, oh. and been so hot from wearing a coat that I end up just in a T-shirt in the snow. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't I probably, I think there's like a golden two weeks as autumn comes in. Yeah. No, not too hot, not too cold. That'd probably be my ideal condition. Yeah, sort of September time. Yeah, that's the perfect time for me. Yeah, me too. Um, if there's one thing you could change about the way archaeology is structured at the moment, what would it be? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, that's a tough one. It that, is. That's a tough one. I'd, I'd maybe... I'd maybe try and make some changes to the commercial sector, um, get the wages a bit higher, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's quite a good one to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you think archaeology is relevant today and, ha and how does it help us? Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely relevant today. Um, I think with No Roses, the kind of underlying message of, of that was that we by by telling that story of, of the past then it could really make hopefully try and make people think about the way we live today and i think that applies as well to the the community romany community project because you know we're highlighting what happened back then and and that's still um okay in england they're not still putting compounds per se although they're not far off but um that highlights that and so many people don't realize that that, that, that was a thing back then and i think so no, i did yeah and i think a lot of people don't realize just how much um the traveler community gets uh, abused to this day so it's kind of a perfect example of using archaeology to highlight 
the present day and to hopefully try and change things for the future. Um, I, I agree. And I, I think although your projects seem quite different, they're still shown an underrepresented story. So with your No Roses, I had no idea Could, because that genre is studied to the nth degree you know that every tv channel on freeview has always got something about that and when i saw that I thought why has nobody even <laughs> looked at this before and then with your romany project i didn't even know not that i expect to know everything but you know i thought i don't even know this and so yeah. that's, i think that's why it's so exciting because um it's interesting it's valid and um i you know i feel educated when i'm looking at it and i know that others do because i you know after i first met you i was saying to people did you know this i'm going oh no I've, you know so um it's got legs definitely yeah <laughs> well it's nice of you to say because i feel like with no roses many people have said to me that they didn't realize that after d-day the landing craft was still in the area off no. of the beach uh and and like people think it's a D-Day story, but it's not really a D-Day story. No. It came after uh, D-Day, and and like you say about you didn't know much about the Romani stuff, and I, I that's so important to me because often it can feel like not just in archaeology, but just the general kind of making people aware of of traveller issues is it kind of feels like you're screaming into a void a lot of the time, and that no one's really paying attention. And then every once in a while, I'll have someone say to me, "Oh, I told my friend." about that thing you said and and that kind of makes them all the stress of being like why is no one listening <laughs> oh yeah we are that's the trouble because you're not meeting them face to face and being in a community i don't think you're probably aware of the ripples of mm, you know, yeah, people are talking hopefully. and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this really so that we can put it out there to make you know bigger ripples kind of thing. yeah hopefully that'd be nice yeah um so I, I know I'm chopping and changing here. What? Where's your favourite place? Where would you think, right, this is it, I want to be here? Oh, I don't know the world's a big place. Though. Um, in lockdown, and we're not lockdown, outside of lockdown during the pandemic, I went to North Wales twice for the first time. And yeah. I, that was a great, that was a great place I'd never been before. Um, I spent some time in the Rocky Mountains just before the pandemic. That was pretty, that was pretty cushy and that was nice um so yeah maybe something like that i like living i like being by the sea southwold i like southwold a lot i know these are two two of these places are in britain that's not that exotic but uh, there it is why not we've got our whole theme for our festival is your local place and um, we've got a stories of um places and spaces where people are putting photos up of and why it means so much to them so absolutely it can be yeah um, i think that's local. different isn't it like local places mean something to your life and to you know like southwall i've got loads of memories yeah there. um so i suppose no place like home is there um, so if you could try time travel then what period would you go back to and what would you do um See, I wouldn't go back too far. I'd, uh, no. I'd, probably, I'd probably go back and uh, witness, as as that points out, I'd probably witness the rise of the Beatles, I think. Would probably be my, <laughs> yeah, that was good. My, my moment. Uh, when they play on the top of the uh, the building on Savile Row for their last yeah. performance, I'd, I'd be there, I think. <laughs> with, with the benefit of knowing that it's their last ever show whereas no one else did so i'd be lapping it up a lot more than everyone and else. go and get their signatures and yeah, sell them to fund yeah. your next project absolutely yeah of course yeah <laughs> so moving on then if archaeology was a band what band would it be uh yeah that's that's a that's a toughie i'd maybe maybe i would say uh the e street band you know springsteen's band because i think maybe Archaeology is very eclectic, isn't it? There's yes. A lot, of, lot of different, a uh, lot of different parts to it. And the E Street Band are massive, and there's all sorts of different musicians. So maybe I'd say that. Yeah, lots of different collective people in a collective, but making a difference. Absolutely. And if you were on the desert island, what would archaeological object would you take with you? Um. Well, it's not, it's not a tool, but I'd probably take. Uh, that piece of pottery uh, yeah because it reminds me of how nice it's been to to do this project even though it's such early days uh and if i couldn't have that again an artifact i'd probably take uh the milton hall treasure and i'd probably try and trade it with someone to get get off <laughs> the island. 
because <laughs> it's probably worth quite a bit. So this is the last one, which came from our member of staff. It was, what's the best question about archaeology you've ever been asked? Obviously, um, present conversation can be excluded. <laughs> um, God, I don't, I don't know. Best question I've ever been asked. I'm not it's sure. Never I mean, about I, dinosaurs, though. <laughs> yeah, there's that. I mean, yeah, but that would be, a, wouldn't that be the worst question? The yeah. Stuff asked, probably like, you know, are you going to be on time team or something? That's the yeah. What I get all the time. Um, and I go, no, it was cancelled. <laughs> uh, right, thank, I'm just going to um, tell people who are watching that there's still some amazing events to attend as part of the festival and give, just give them a chance to put forward some other questions. And I'll go into the questions now. Okay, we have Georgina Dorothy. Is there a particular dream artifact or site you'd like to discover that you know of from Romany history stories or legends nationally or globally? What a great question. Great question. Um, I think in, in Britain, I'd love to find sort of a, a Vardo, you know, like the wagons. That'd, oh, be, yeah. that'd be pretty spectacular. Um, that would be that would be a dream find. And and if if not that outside of Britain, probably try and find the sort of origin or like the starting point in, in India would be pretty special, I think. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, Claire has asked, who's our moderator? <laughs> oh, sorry, no, Dan, she says that Dan Turner, who's a London artist under Romany, do you have any plans to examine the history of Romany in this country via the exploration of stopping places? Yeah, we'd we'd like we'd love to do that. Um, the site that we're looking at was originally a stopping place. That's how it became uh, a compound because the travellers are already stopping there. Um, so if if that project goes well, then uh, we'd love to do some uh, more stopping places. Um, the thing with the kind of pilot project is that because it was compound, we know that they were there for a long period of time, even though it was for a negative reason uh, being forced there, but. Um, stopping places would be more difficult but I think there's still a lot of potential to find stuff there I mean my uh, my mum was born in a stopping place and, and I looked on Google Earth the other day and that's uh, that's still a, that's still a field it's still a field so maybe I'll go maybe I'll go and do that do my own family's Romany archaeology <laughs> would you have to do that by like an oral history project or is there any written I know, I know from speaking to other people that most of it's oral stories that have been um, passed down, um, not necessarily written. So are you secretly writing things that people tell you or are you sworn to secrecy? Well, yeah, um, not, not a lot of stuff is traditionally written down. Um, but yeah, people come to us with, with tales and uh, we're lucky that the compound itself for the pilot project was quite well documented. Um, All right. And because the families are still in the area uh, who can literally tell us, oh, that's, you know, that's where my nan was born or stuff like that. So. Yeah. Um, Sarah's got a good question. What will happen to any finds from the dig? Um, well, from the pilot project, they're going to be stored at the New Forest Heritage Centre. Um, and we're, I think the plan is to kind of put together a little display, which will be really spectacular. And I think we're going to work with the, uh, the local traveller community. I, to do that, excuse me. Uh, Georgina, um, Dorothy again, how long ago in time do you hope to or know you can find archaeological evidence of Romany heritage? Um, let's, let's go right back to when Romany first got here, I reckon 500 years, I, I, think, we can, <laughs> I okay. think we can do it. Let's, let's go for the big one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, do you have a favourite bit of music to listen to whilst working? That's from um, Sam, Sam Horn. Well, it's funny when I've been writing the book, I'm quite lucky because uh, the film had a, its own orchestral score written for it. Uh, so when I was at university, uh, like a lot of people do, I think listen to like instrument, instrumental sort of piano music and stuff like that. But when No Roses came out, I ended up having kind of my own soundtrack for that story. So when I've been writing the book, uh, I listen to that quite a lot because it puts me back into that uh, mindset of actually doing the shipwreck search. But other than that, um, I, yeah, I just kind of listen to songs that I've never heard before so that I don't get distracted. It's kind of my key thing. Okay. Um, Andrew says, how strong are the Romani languages and dialects? 
and are they under threat from changes forced on the GRT community? As part of this, how important is language in the archaeological investigation and inquiries and can they be preserved? Um, yeah, the Romani language, I mean, it varies so much between countries, uh, it even varies between areas in the UK. Um, some communities speak it a lot more than others but it's it's certainly i mean it's it's in it's in danger in the sense that a lot of younger generations don't speak it don't carry it on um whether that's through sort of assimilation that they've not wanted to go through or um you know their relatives not wanting them to speak it because it causes you a lot of trouble when people find out that's who you are so it's definitely being lost um and in terms of it being important to the archaeology, um, yeah, as of now, it's not too important to the project we're working on because uh, it's quite a recent sort of excavation. But I suppose it's, it, may, it may become more important as the, uh, as the project moves on. I suppose we'll see. That's an interesting topic, actually. Yeah. OK. Um, Sam. Again, did you enjoy the underwater explorations? Yeah, I mean, I've only done it once for no roses. I've dived quite a bit, but for an actual expedition, only the one time. And it was uh, it was really enjoyable. It was, it was really stressful as well. Because um, when I dive on the on the wreck in the film, it's the first time I'd ever dived out of a dinghy. Every other time I kind of walked off the shore or in a quarry just to train. Um, so that was a huge no pun intended, like jumping in at the deep end. It was really savage, suddenly being five miles out to sea in the English Channel. Yeah. Um, and the, and I'd only ever dived in a quarry in Leicester and, the, and Malta, where the sea's normally quite calm. So suddenly being in the Channel, it was so kind of immediately different. Um, and being down on the wreck, I was kind of getting pulled off of it by the covering and, uh, you know, swayed side to side when I was on the uh, the line coming back up. and. So there was, there was an element of it that was really enjoyable, which is the kind of adventure of it all and the excitement of seeing uh, the wreck. But it was definitely, um, there's a, a, a lot to think about. And it's, it's very, uh, it can be quite, um, it can be quite scary. Diving. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah, but we'll see. I'm, I'm sure I'll do it again one day. Um, somebody said she, they I think this might be Claire, I recently visited the Tinker's Heart near Loch Fyne, which I think is one of the only traveller sites to be recognised as a national monument. Do you think there are more sites that should be recognised in this way, or is there a better way to recognise and celebrate the GRT history? Um, well, yeah, I've, I've never been to the Tinker's Heart, but I've read a lot about it, and it looks, it looks really special. I'd love to get up there. Um, I think in terms of kind of commemorating other sites i mean you've you've got appleby which is kind of a living monument to the grt community uh that's such a historic site where people have been going to trade horses and, and stuff like that for for so long um and that kind of stands as its own sort of monument to to the living memory of it um but i think there's still such a long way to go to even get to the point of uh commemorating traveler sites uh because we kind of have to get travelers actual equal rights first yeah. uh, before we start thinking about that sort of thing um so yeah a, lot, a long way to go to get to that point but we're, we're we're certainly making a making a dent i mean the place we're working at um in the new forest uh potentially that could, that could be a spot to sort of have a plaque or something it surely does well, that ties in with um Raina ramsey because um you've already answered part of her question but she wondered if there should be a, a museum of romany history there um as part of the new forest heritage center well th there is a um there is a a, a romany museum in the uk um where is it it's the boswell museum but i'm not sure where it is to be honest uh, okay. up north somewhere um so you know if people want to find out they can find out about these sort of things and they can learn and go to the sort of that museum and and uh the some in europe i once walked right across uh belgrade in the freezing cold to get to a romany museum uh with my best mate and then when i got there it was shut and we'd be walking oh. for hours and hours and hours and it was really upsetting but uh, one day i'd like to go to that <laughs> um sarah bailey says um how old was the bramble basket uh, that was from the 1960s 
if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay, and um, anonymous, somebody anonymous doesn't know you very well because they said, do you have a hat? If not, why not? All the coolest archaeologists have a hat. But if anybody sees you on Twitter, you've always got a hat on <laughs> when you're on site. Not always, but I do. Well, uh, you do have a hat. <laughs> I, I treat myself to a very nice hat when I was living in Canada. And, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a pretty nice hat. Yes. Almost too nice to wear on a dig, to be honest. Yeah. And that, um, another person said, what's the weirdest unexplained thing that you found? Um, I went through a period of finding lo loads of uh, baby dolls' arms on a dig. Oh, dig. no. Popping up, yeah. Fake teeth. I found someone's dentures. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, and that, it's not that weird, but we, we once found um, the, little, the little man from the James Bond car from the 60s, the ejector man. All oh, right. Yeah, we found him and it, it, was, it was an excavation at a castle, but that was actually probably the coolest thing we, we found. So it's, in the finds identification book, like you have pottery finds and lithic finds, is there a James Bond car character find book? How did well, you Well, I mean, I, I might have to create one if <laughs> keep up this amazing look. And Natalia says, out of all the things you've done so far, what's your biggest personal and professional accomplishment? Um probably making a feature length documentary uh, at the age of 25 that was quite a big one and then signing a book deal that was really yeah that's pretty good that was, that was a dream come true that was kind of uh I always being an author was kind of my top priority since I was a kid and then everything else that's come with like archaeology and making films has just kind of been it's all part of the same web yeah. that's coming together yeah that's I've been I've been I've been lucky I've been lucky I think yeah there's a different look and hard work probably yeah a lot a lot of hard work I yeah i know you can't just say you've been lucky because that just doesn't come um <laughs> i'm going to finish um uh psycho groves they say they have dual uk citizenship and they're planning on heading over this after the pandemic subsides once they're allowed um are there any sites that you would recommend to a fellow archaeologist to start off with in the uk um, well, if you've got dual citizenship, then you can surely work in the UK. Yeah. So you could get a job in commercial archaeology almost straight away. And there's lots of jobs and you could go all over the country digging up all your dream sites and having a great time. So just have a look for some jobs in that sector. You'll be away. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. We're just going to yeah. put up the, um, the poll. Um, I think Claire's going to put that up now and um, she'll let us know when it's finished. Um, really appreciate you spending time with oh, us tonight. Um, um, it's been really interesting. And um, although we had the conversation with you before this started, I've learned a lot tonight. Um, and this is my first interview. <laughs> Well, you've done Normally great. it's um, our chief executive, but he's in a tent walking around England and, and Wales as part of the festival. So um well done. I've done a lot of interviews. This is definitely this is up there. It's in the oh thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um yeah, we really appreciate it. So once the poll's over, um the uh, webinar will just stop because there's no niceties in Zoom, it doesn't just uh, sing you out and um yeah. say goodbye. But um Claire's just sorting the poll out now. You can go down the pub now when this is once this is dark do nothing to relax <laughs> thank you everyone for taking part in the poll and you'll be sent an email with a questionnaire after um, this helps us with our funders and um, so that we can help promote more people like the Romani project and other smaller community groups because without our funders we simply can't do this <laughs>